So for me at that point, it wasn't who can I see for free? It was who will listen to me and help me. So, you know, really please do not let your finances get in the way of your health. Fear stops us from achieving our true greatness. Are you a professional woman who is feeling stuck, unmotivated, or burned out? Are you worried about your wellness? Are you letting fear stop you from crushing your goals? If you answered yes to any or all of these, then this is the podcast for you. Dr. Charmaine Gregory, Night Shift Emergency Physician, Burnout Thriver, and Wellness Champion, along with everyday heroes just like you, will explore how to face fear in our lives and emerge victoriously. Hey, thanks for checking out this episode. Be sure to click the subscribe button and the notification bell so you get notified when the next video comes out. It only takes two seconds to make two clicks. So let's do it. Let's get back to the video. Hello, 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 Fearless Freedom Tribe. This is Dr. G and we are back for another episode of the Fearless Freedom with Dr. G podcast. And today we have Magic Barclay with us, and she's going to tell you all about who she is and what she is up to. Take it away, Magic. Well, hi, thanks for having me. I am actually a functional health practitioner. And what I do is I look for root cause of what's making people unwell, whether that be childhood trauma, whether it be a pathogenic activity you know whether it's just something else going on and I look at all the systems of the body and how they work together and what they're telling us fantastic yeah I'm sure there's a lot um a lot to unpack there because as you said there's a multifactorial um response to our health right and and um what is behind it so tell us about how you got into this how fear played a role in you getting involved in this how you help people with fear. Sure. How I got into this was my fear of dying and leaving my kids behind. So I let my health get so out of control, not let it, that's blaming me and it wasn't my fault. But I didn't know how to look for what was going on till I got to the point of having to tell my kids, mummy might not be here next year. And, you know, that's a pretty scary moment. I did fear death and I did fear what would happen to my kids and I did fear that even if I didn't die was this going to be the rest of my life the pain the the terror inside my own body and inside my own mind and so I decided I wasn't going to play that game and I was actually going to you know look at fear as one of two things it's either forget everything and run or forget everything and rise and I was sick of running so I rose to the occasion, threw myself into my studies. And, you know, that was six years ago now, almost seven years ago. And here I am. And I love what I do. And I love that my kids are now young men that live with me. And I get to see their faces every day. And, you know, I still have fear, but I don't let it control me because I understand the science of fear and that living in fear all my life was making me sick. So you have to tell us, thank you for sharing that story. That is, um, that is very, very like helpful for us to know, like where you're coming from. You have to tell us what was it? I mean, like, why did you have that thought to even say that to your children? Was it, you know, did you have like some kind of medical illness? Like, what was it that was going on yeah. with you at the time? Yeah. So I had cancer. I had stage four cancer. And I was pretty much told, this is it. You know, this is progressing faster than we thought. This is the end. And I also had a few other conditions like diabetes. I'd contracted Lyme. So there was a lot going on in my body. And the prognosis medically wasn't great. But that was from a traditional medicine standpoint, which is very reductionist. So they look at one thing. And it's not their fault. They don't have time to look at everything. I make the time, but, you know. Sure. But it was looking at the cancer as the problem, not as the cancer as the result. So for me, it was, you know, have that conversation with the kids. And that's probably what I needed to do at the time because seeing their little faces with tears rolling down their faces, like no one wants to put their kids through that, but it made me rise to the occasion. 
Okay, so now we have to know how is it that you went from being told that you have stage four cancer, dismal prognosis with other comorbidities, right? To surviving that. Did you do, I mean, did you go through chemotherapy? Did you do any of that stuff? So I did surgery. Like I got okay, so the surgery. cancerous organ taken out. Okay. And then I threw myself into the natural therapies. I didn't do chemo and radiation. Just didn't sit right with me. And I'd spoken to quite a few people that worked in those fields and they were like yeah you know maybe not so for me and I'm saying for me this is not general medical advice for everyone else but for me just doing the surgery and then looking at the natural therapies was the best way to go and I don't stick my head in the sand you know for all the naysayers out there I'm I'm not saying I'm cancer free forever I keep an eye on all my markers and I really do pay attention to what my body's doing but as I said for me the cancer wasn't the cause it was the result so I then had to look at how did this happen to me how did I get to this point it doesn't just happen out of nowhere so for me it was looking at what got me there and then going back and fixing that and you know a big thing was repeated trauma and not speaking my voice and not feeling like I could reach out so for years I was feeling unwell being told by doctors there's nothing wrong with me and I didn't push the point you know I did to a certain extent but then I gave up and was it at that point when I stopped going hey you need to listen to me something's wrong was that when the cancer started growing was that when the cancer started accelerating we don't know, but what I do know is that there was so much pathogenic activity, so much high cortisol, so much stress, so much sympathetic nervous system dominance that I'd be surprised if I didn't get the cancer. Interesting. So I just want to make sure that people who are listening who are not medical um, are aware, right? So remember that Magic said that this was her specific case, okay? Like, her case was able to be treated with surgery and then natural therapies. Okay. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, you mentioned that you were unable to advocate for yourself or you didn't feel empowered to advocate for yourself. Um, when you went to the doctor and you felt something was wrong. Now, did you feel like there was pain somewhere or you just felt overall ill? What was it that you were feeling in that time? Yeah, bit of both. So, so I had did pain. have chronic, yeah, did have chronic pain. I was unable to swallow. I felt like there was like a tire around my neck and, you know, I just felt really unwell. I was gaining weight at an accelerant speed and, you know, I was losing things like feeling in my fingers and, you know, I'd go to open a jar and instead of twisting the top, the whole jar would fall out of my hands. Or I would, you know, go to do something at the gym because I was trying to lose my weight. Yeah. And I just couldn't get the message to my legs and my hands. Like it was like something was stopping the messages from my brain. So mm. there was a lot of what we call whispers of right. the body. And, you know, I was just going to the doctor saying something's wrong, something's wrong, because I wasn't a medical expert. I hadn't looked into this myself. I was in fitness and I was wondering why the heck am I not losing weight when I work out three hours a day. So, you know, there was some stuff there that were red flags. And uh, for me, it was just a generalized spectrum of, of symptoms that every time I reported them, I was told, you know what, uh, that's nothing. Uh, everyone gets that. Don't worry about it. And, you know, it got to the point when I found finally a doctor that did listen to me and he said this doesn't sound good we need to do some investigation so the vindication came but it came almost too late luckily it okay. wasn't too late again. and you know all I can say to the listeners is if you feel something is wrong you're right okay you need to find you need to keep finding a doctor that will listen to you all right, you are not attention seeking. You are not overplaying things. If you don't feel right, something's not right. Simple as that. So um, the other thing that I was curious about 
is, um, can you tell the audience where you're located? Yeah, I'm in Australia. Yeah. So our medical system is very different to the US medical system. Health insurance is a thing here, but you can still get treatment without health insurance. We have a Medicare system, so the government can pick up the tab for certain things or at least a proportion of certain things. Back then when I was dealing with this, most of our general practitioners or GPs, local doctors, were bulk billing. They started not bulk billing, so charging you for things. So for me at that point it wasn't who can I see for free, it was who will listen to me and help me. So, you know, really please do not let your finances get in the way of your health. There will be a a doctor for you that will work with you and you know just ask the question if if your medical care seems unaffordable to say how can i make this work but say that with the doctor's surgery so that they know that you want to work with them but you know finance shouldn't uh rule out that you get some help yeah absolutely Absolutely. And then, and then, so I don't know, I'm, I'm like, in my mind, I have an idea of what your issue was, but I don't want to say it unless you want to say it. I don't know if you want to say it, but um, I guess the thing that I'm trying to figure out is, was this something that would have been detected on surveillance, right? So like, for example, um, you know, we survey for cervical cancer, right? We survey by doing pap smears, you know, um, for a number of years, and then we take a break and then we start again. We survey for um, breast cancer earlier if you have a history in a family um, or if you're, you know, if there's some reason why it would need to be done earlier, but at 40 and up, we survey for um, colon cancer at age 50, you know, again, earlier, if you have multiple, multiple cases of diverticulitis, they want to check and make sure you don't have anything cancerous going on. So I don't know. It doesn't sound like what you had going on with you was in the category of the surveillance that we typically would do at the various ages. Is that correct? Correct. So I had thyroid cancer and you know what? No one looks for it. And even when I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, before they realized it was stage four, when they told me, Oh, we think it's stage three, maybe three a, which means it's localized Four is when it hits your lymph nodes and starts traveling. Mm -hmm. They said, but don't worry, of all the cancers, this one takes the longest to kill you. So I'm sitting there going like. Somebody told you that? Oh, I'm so sorry. I I apologize on behalf of the entire medical community because that's not cool. So I'm sitting there. I've just been told I've got cancer, but don't worry, this one takes the longest to kill you. Oh, my god, That's not exactly a comforting thought. And then when they did further investigation, which actually was at the time of surgery, they were going to take just the right side of my thyroid because they thought that's where the tumour was. That's, you know, where all the the probing and the scanning and the biopsies, that's where it showed. And then they opened me up and they went, ah, it's right across the whole back of the thyroid. And it was in my lymph nodes. That's when they discovered it's stage four, you know, so... They alluded to that before because of the way I was feeling and the way I was starting to puff up. You can see here I've got lymphedema left over from the surgery. But the way I was starting to puff up around my neck, they said, look, this is, we think this is in your lymph nodes. We don't think this is localised. And that's stage four. And I'm like, okay, but don't worry, it takes the longest to kill you. All right. Oh, my gosh. But if it's in my lymph nodes, that means it's travelling. So for me... As a lay person in the medical field at that point, it already didn't sound right. No. And then, yeah, you know, I wake off. up, I've got the cage around my neck and I'm in the right. hospital ward. And, I mean, for anyone that's ever seen someone that's been through thyroid surgery, it ain't pretty. You look like Frankenstein for a while. but Yeah, you have that large you know, uh, scar. Yeah, I wake up and I've got the cage on my neck to keep me still. Yeah. And they're like, well, it was worse than we thought it was. And you know how we said it takes longest to kill you. Lucky we did the surgery because this one really was going to kill you. Oh so, no, there is no testing for it that we do regularly. I think times have changed now and doctors do do thyroid tests more often now. Yeah. But, I mean, here in Australia I send clients to their GPs yes. for a full thyroid panel. 
and they come back with just TSH, which is oh, dear Lord. stimulating hormones. Yes, uh, it's not just their panel. <laughs> no, or they come back with TSH, T3, T4. And I go, where's the antibodies? Where's the ratios? Right, like, right, where's right. the rest of it? So we're still not testing in a medical fraternity properly. A full thyroid panel is a full thyroid panel, not, you know, some partial figures that may allude to something that don't give us the full picture. And what I see. Don't check a whole panel. Yeah. Yeah, what I, I mean, here we do clients. it. I mean, we check the whole panel. We check the whole thing. I know. Like yeah, if, we'll we're, see, we don't. if somebody's we don't. coming in and they're complaining of like, you know, man, I'm losing a whole bunch of weight or a man, I'm getting a whole bunch of weight. They're like, or I just feel really tired. I mean, part of the fatigue workup is a thyroid panel. Like that is yeah. just standard, right? So that's why I'm like kind of confused, you know, as you're talking about this. Yeah. And then the other thing too, I mean, I'm not a GP, I'm an emergency doctor, but like, my reasons for checking thyroid studies are very different than what a GP would be. Like I check it in people who are septic, you know, like they're behaving like sepsis because you can get something called thyroid storm that can also behave like sepsis. So like my reason for checking it very different. But when I go to my doctor um, and my doctor's checking me, part of what they do is they feel my neck. They're like, Hey, do you have a goiter? Like what's going on? And they ask me all the questions. And then if there's anything that would trigger you know, instability metabolism, a thyroid panel is ordered. So that's why I'm I'm just like, as I'm listening, I'm just kind of like, interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's we're different. A bit it's a little different. You guys. A little different. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, that's fine. I mean, I just wanted to get a, a good like perspective on on the situation, right? Because yeah. if somebody's listening, they're gonna think, oh my God, like if I live in, I don't know, wherever they're listening and they live there. And it's not Australia and they're going to be thinking, oh, my goodness, then, you know, is this going to happen to me as well? So I just want to I just wanted to make sure that that was clear how the steps happened and what happened there. So thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Yeah. So this is why it's important to be your best health advocate. Absolutely. And to not live in fear of what the doctors are saying. They can hand down a diagnosis or a prognosis, but that's because that's from the data they've got. It is not something for you to go home and start living in fear about. It's something for you to go home and go, now, what do I do? What's my next step? And, you know, if that means annoying the heck out of your local doctor and just going, okay, you've told me this, what do I do now? You know, then so be it. They're there to help you. They're not there for you to obey, right? They're not living in your body because that's when we start living in fear. When we feel like we can't share what's going on with us with our professionals, that's when we start to get scared. And then that starts another whole medical crisis. You know, you become cortisol junkies, basically. Your adrenals start getting overworked. And that can lead to a whole another array of problems. So what I'm saying is if you feel something is not right, say it. Don't go, oh, maybe I shouldn't tell them. Maybe I don't have time in my consult to tell them. Make the time. Hey, it's Dr. G, and I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to this episode. I'm so honored to have you here with me. Did you know that I can help you to get your own podcast started? With my podcasting launch course for professionals, I walk you through everything you need to know about starting a podcast. I'm with you every step of the way from sign up to launching your show with five episodes ready to go. There's a done for you version that's also available. If you would just rather just do recordings and leave the behind the scenes work up to us, then that one is definitely for you. But either way, we've got your back here at Fearless Freedom with Dr. G. Oh, if you already have a show and you need production services, we have monthly plans available for you. So check out the links in the episode show notes for more information. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, I cannot speak for GPs or, you know, internists or family medicine doctors because I'm an emergency doctor. And for me, I have to get all the data in like 15 seconds. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to make big decisions, you know, about like, what am I going to do to save your life in, you know, the next 10 minutes? <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. it's a little different, but absolutely. I do agree 
that you have to be your own advocate because there is absolutely no way. And, and like you said, you know, your doctor is dealing with the data that's presented to them. Right. And then it's, it's sometimes it's very difficult uh, to take a bird's eye view and kind of piece together all of the consultations. Right. So say, for example, you said, I'm having difficulty swallowing on one. They're like, oh, it's probably just a sore throat. Right. But then the next time you're like, but wait, I've been working out and I still can't lose weight. Like what's going on there? So they're not connecting the two things to really put it together because the thyroid would tie all that stuff in. Right. Because if you have yeah. pressure on your throat, that's why you can't swallow because the thyroid's right there over your throat area. And if you're, you know, having difficulty with metabolism, the thyroid controls all of that. You know, like if you have temperature regulation problems, it's the thyroid again. So like if you, if you piece together all of the little pieces of the puzzle, then yes, it's very clear. But if the person is not in that frame of mind, that they're going to be picking up all of those details and putting it together, they're just not going to put it together. And it's, it's like, um, there's a, there's a bias that it's, that it's called, and I can't think of what it is right now. But it's like a it's like an early I mean, it's an early closure bar, bias. Right. So they hear what you're saying, but they have already had a preconce preconception of what they think it should be and what the end result is. Instead of having an open mind and listening to all of the information and then from that sifting out what comes together and makes sense because the patient doesn't know what we need to know. I mean, and that's just, these are the facts. Like even in my area, you know, there are times when, you know, I will work somebody up and I'm, I'm talking to them. I'm like, do you have any medical problems? And they're like, no, I have nothing. I have nothing. Then I'm like, let me see your pills. And then they give me like 20 pills and it's not the patient's fault, but it's like in their mind, they're like, she said medical problems. I don't have any medical problems. I have diabetes and high blood and all these things, but you know, like, so that is the data that the doctor needs in order to make the best decision for you. But if they don't, if you don't know what data to give and they're not getting the data, then you are not going to get the outcome. So this exactly. is why I do agree with you, Magic, when you say you have to advocate if you still don't feel like, you know, your concerns are being addressed. And sometimes it's just really hard to articulate that as a patient, which I totally understand. I mean, I've been a patient and, and as a patient who it has medical knowledge, even with that, I've had situations where my concerns have not been addressed. So I can't imagine like if you have no medical knowledge and you're faced with something as I want to say catastrophic because it is catastrophic as catastrophic as being told you have cancer. And then there's no context to that. Right. Like there's absolutely zero context. Oh, don't worry. You, it's not one that's going to kill you fast. Like, oh, my God. I mean, it, it's like somebody hearing that who number one is thinking, oh my God, I have young children at home. What am I going to do? How are we going to work this out? Then you're like, okay, how am I going to make it through the illness? Like, wh what, what does this mean? Like, what, what am I going to be like? Am I going to suffer? You know, like all these things are going through your mind. And it's like, you have taken something that was initially like uh, a stressor, right? A major stressor. And you have basically turned it into an atomic bomb of stress. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so, you know, it's like, you really have to, and, and this is something that we are very guilty of. I, I will say like, even for me, like I have to build rapport, like instantaneously, like, and a lot of times I'm working with very little information, having to make very big decisions about people's lives. And even with that, I try my very best to like, just listen a little bit, listen, because oftentimes if I listen that one little piece of information will come forward. Or if I ask just one more question, that one little bit of information will come forward that will make all the difference in the care. And so and you, know, you shouldn't stop the, asking questions. You shouldn't stop put, from putting forward your concerns. Totally. And as a patient, there is something simple that you can do to help your medical professional or your naturopath or your functional medicine specialist, whoever you're working with, Write it down. Yes, If you absolutely. think of something like, oh, I can't swallow properly. Oh, my temperature's all over the place. Or, you know, oh, I'm not losing weight. Don't wait to get to the surgery or the clinic or the, you know, ER or wherever you end up. Don't wait for then to think of your laundry list of what's going on. Write it down as it's happening because 
so many people get white coat syndrome. I know clients come to me and, you know, when they do come to me for a, a root cause analysis, which is our complementary consult, they go, why do you have a 33-page intake form? Because I want that laundry list of what's been going on right back to when you were born. Like I need to know everything to get the full picture. But if you're not seeing someone like me and you're you're going to a doctor, go with your list because if you have white coat syndrome and you get there, it's like, you know, you've got dancing clowns in your head. Like you can't remember anything. And the doctor says, so what's been going on? Oh, just don't feel really good. Like, right. you know, <laughs> yeah. but there's actually been all these other things happening. So help whoever you're working with by writing it down, making sure that that history is there because in the field of medicine, we can only look at history. So, you know, maybe you're seeing, I don't know if you have them over there in the US, but here we have, you know, big medical clinics now. It's not your local doc, doc whoever at the corner with his shingle right, out with the a front. shingle outside. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're seeing maybe one of 50 doctors in a complex. You're not seeing the same one every single time. They don't have time to go trawling through your file, okay? It's a sad state of affairs that doctors are so pushed now. Yeah. I'm talking from Australian standards to basically they have 15 minutes with you. So, you know, you have your history. And you say, hey, I don't know if it means anything, but you know what? This has been happening and maybe that's something you need to know. Yes. Do yeah, not no, expect them to spend the 15 minutes they have with you trawling through your history. And if you go to different clinics, that history won't be traveling with you. It stays at that clinic. So it is up to you to be your best advocate. Not as great advice. Definitely having a journal with what's happening with you. And I'm just going to throw this in there because I tell people this all the time where, you know, have some kind of like laminated card or something with like, you know, your, your, your demo info and like your allergies and your uh, medications that are currently taking, not like all the things, but like the ones you're actually taking with the milligrams with the amount of times you're taking it every day, all that stuff. Like you are even go back and think about every surgery you've had. Think about all of the things people have told you that you've had, you know, because having that on hand is just so good because there may be a time and hopefully there isn't, but there may be a time when you're not able to speak for yourself but you have that and you could just be like, Hey, here's my inf information, particularly if you're going to be going to different places. So as, as you mentioned magic, like different clinics, you know, you have different data available there. The same thing is true. So right now I'm in Guam, but when I was in the United States, there's definitely like the electronic medical record was within hospital systems. It wasn't something that was nationwide. So you could conceivably be living in one state, and you go to a medical facility in that state, they have a record of you, but then you go to a different place and they have nothing. So it's good for you to have that information on hand, along with a journal with your symptoms that helps your doctor greatly to get to the bottom of what is going on with you and able to help you in the best way possible. So that's great advice. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> no worries. And just a disclaimer on my behalf here that I am not at all a proponent of data farming and, you know, having your data centralized to everyone. I think that is a really, really bad idea for humanity. But what I think is a great idea is that you have your data. So you have this journal of think back to when you were born and how were you born and then what happened and, you know, did you get a virus and did you have some bacterial overload and like put all of this in obviously in what you know, ask your family, you know, certainly ask your parents before you, it sounds terrible, before you lose them because we age as people and we forget things. And so get all that information and keep it with you. That is your information. So I do not like this whole idea that, you know, the world seems to be heading towards of your information can be accessed by anyone. You know, from a medical standpoint, it is a good idea that every doctor be able to get your information. But from a privacy standpoint, I think that's 
quite alarming. So, you know, you are your advocate. It is your information. It is about you. And every time you have a blood test, anytime you get any test done, get copies of it for you because it's your information. So I just had to say that because I really don't like this whole, you know, data sharing thing. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I will tell you, though, that like um, being a part of a system where that information is available is quite helpful. Um, And it actually will streamline your care because of the fact that people are not double testing you or double doing things. So but I understand what you're saying about the privacy thing. I guess I figure like, you know, there is no privacy at all anymore anyway. So <laughs> but, <laughs> I haven't given I mean, up I on mean, that dream of true. privacy. But, but there isn't, right? Because you and you have a, I don't know what, it, what you, if you have a social security number in Australia, but you have a number obviously, right? Or else you wouldn't be able to participate in the health system, right? Yeah. So that's yeah. already, your information is already out there. So, I mean, it's nothing's really private, but true. you know, <laughs> I don't know. But definitely, um, but definitely, uh, definitely keep something on you with all your data. That would be really helpful. Yeah. Awesome. So tell us now. Um, so what are your so you mentioned that you were in you went to school and what kind of training did you have? Let us know what that is. Yeah. So I have studied under a couple of um, doctors who put courses out worldwide for practitioners to upskill. So one is uh, functional health solutions and innate immunity. I've also worked under um, Dr. Perry Nicholson from Stop Chasing Pain. So I've really thrown myself into my studies. You know, I've looked at everything that's coming out. I, I read the works of Dr. Gabor Mate. I think he's fantastic. And, you know, I really keep accelerating my knowledge because as a practitioner, we can't just go, oh, well, what I know today is everything because tomorrow new studies come out. Yeah. You know, this is why we have PubMed and The Lancet and things like this, all these journals where these studies are coming out and some of them are absolutely fascinating. Like you can become, you know, a research junkie basically because it's terrific. Well, for me it is. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, yeah, it's about accelerating my studies. And so what I've looked at is very much the functional medicine route and that's an ongoing journey of discovery. Awesome. Awesome. And then, so tell us then, what is a service that you provide to your clients? Yeah. So what we provide is called a holistic approach reset. And so we look at all the systems of the body and how are they working together? And, you know, why have you had to take medications or why have you had a surgery? What caused that? So in coaching, there's a skill called the five times why. And so that is, you know, you go for business coaching. Why do you want this? Yes, but why? But why? But why? Well, we do that with health. So, okay, so you're dealing with eczema, but why? Is it a broken barrier, skin barrier? Okay, but why? Is it connected to the gut? All right, but why? Is it a pathogen? Yes, maybe, but why? Is there an imbalance going on? So we look at what actually started it, what happened first, what was the root cause to trigger the series of symptoms or conditions or whatever ends up being. And, you know, definitely with autoimmune, this is what we see. The autoimmune isn't the problem. It's the result. So, you know, eczema is the result. What happened before that? And that's what we do. We treat that root cause. Awesome. And then, so how do people get in contact with you? So, so is it just Australians or is this worldwide? No, we work worldwide and we have a network of practitioners that we can refer to as well. So people can get in touch with us at www.holisticnaturalhealth.com.au. And that's holistic with a W because we treat with holism. Every single system of the body talks to every other system. So we have to look at the person as a whole. And so what we do is our root cause analysis, which is complementary. And from there, you know, if it's something that I know someone else specializes in, I will send you to that practitioner. Um, If it's something I specialize in, well, I will suggest to work with you. If it's something that one of my team specializes in, again, I'll send you to them. So 
sometimes we just can't work with people. We just say we're not the right fit. You know, it might be them, it might be us, it might be their history, like it might be that we find a better practitioner, it might be that they need to go back and do some other testing, but we're going to be ethical and sustainable with your treatment. Awesome. 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 Okay. No, that's great. I think that, um, you know, that is very important. And I'm assuming that from what you described, you said the intake form, the initial questionnaire is 33 pages. So that tells me that the consultations themselves are not 15 minutes. Am I right? No, they're, they're about an hour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's it's so interesting because I've talked to colleagues who have done like concierge medicine, for example, and they will say that, you know, having the longer times with the patients has made a big difference because of exactly what you said, right? Like you're able to dig a little deeper, you're able to get to the bottom of why things are happening. And in some cases, maybe a lot of cases, I don't know, maybe I don't know what your numbers are, but maybe in a lot of cases, you're even able to get them to the point where they're in a better state of health and not as dependent on, you know, medications or interventions and things of that nature. So I think that's amazing. It's really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. All right. So magic, we are at that part of the show where we do our tradition. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. The first one is, if I am fearless, I will. Okay, if I'm fearless, I will live each day fully. Love it. Love it. The next one is, to me, fearless freedom means. Uh, to me, it means being able to treat yourself and others ethically and sustainably. Awesome. Awesome. And... My battle cry is. My battle cry is be true to yourself, love yourself and honor yourself. Awesome. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day. I know it's day because the same timeline as me and uh, spending time with us here on the Phyllis Freedom Tribe. We really appreciate it and we appreciate all your insight and your sharing Um, I know it's not an easy thing to share in public what you've gone through as far as a medical struggle, you know, having had that situation where you had to have a difficult talk with your children, but we are super happy that you chose to face fear and rise because that is the name of the game. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much magic for everything. Thank you so much for having me. And you know, if my story helps people out there, that's what it's about. It's not about just keeping the knowledge to myself. It's about sharing. Absolutely. And as for one more, one more time in case they missed it, can you give the website again? Yeah, it's www.holisticnaturalhealth.com.au and it's holistic with a W. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Awesome. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Fearless Freedom with Dr. G. Again, I'm Dr. G. And if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe so that you can get notified of when the next episode is going to be. And also, I'll catch you next time. Have a great one. Be strong, be brave, and unleash your greatness.